Merlin is uh, joining us from uh, Gloucester, Gloucester, in Gl Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire, and Sophie is joining us from uh, Hudson Valley, Kingston area. So, so thank you guys. Thanks so much. You know, uh, we're, we're seeing we've been witnessing this great increase of interest in plant medicine, health, mushroom, medicinal mushrooms, psychedelics, the whole thing. And we, I think that it's really exciting to have you guys so we could talk more about the real ethos and richness of the influence of fungi and mycelium on our culture and history. And I thought that it'd be great if, um, if we just let Sophie uh, ask Merlin a few questions and back and forth and, and go from there, you know? So take it away, Sophie, and I'll, I'll assist as I can. Hey, wow, well, big, big intro. Um, well, I think the thing I'm very interested in about, and I've been ruminating on for a long time, is there seems to be like a dominant refrain in your book, Merlin, of forking and fusing, anastomosing how mycelial systems will connect and then branch as they discover and forage and create connectivity. And then that also seems to show up on a kind of more macroscopic level in evolution. And we've thought for so long that evolution is just about diversifying and breaking off. And as a mythologist, I've been really interested in syncretic fusions of cultures and mythologies that have to digest each other. And then I was, as I was reading your book, I was also thinking about how that happens on an evolutionary scale, how there are periods of time where we, we fork off and then moments where symbiosis seems crucial. And, you know, I was wondering what creates the environment, the weather systems where symbiosis is possible? Is it extreme conditions like we're in right now? What makes organisms decide to risk their own shape and become something else? Yes, I think this is such an important theme, um, this idea that in evolution, we are, we don't just see endless divergence, um, like the branches of a tree diverging from each other, forking and forking and forking. Um, but the branches of the tree of life that have been separate for potentially hundreds of millions of years can come together, can flow together, can fuse uh, and create an entirely new lineage. Um, of course, but even before symbiosis, there were ways in which we could see convergence in evolutionary history. Um, convergent evolution is one of, the, for me, one of the most fascinating aspects of evolution, that similar habits, behaviors, or forms can arise independently multiple times. And um, for an eye to evolve, or for a fruit, let's say fruit, um, fruits are an example of a, a convergent form, or, or nematode eating, uh, nematode hunting, hunting in fungi, it's evolved multiple times across the fungal um, kingdom. Um, and, um, and so as if independently, and um, so these are ways in which evolutionary habits consolidate. Uh, and uh, it's a bit like in mycelial networks where you see um, mycelium can, um, can spread um, and uh, spread across uh, and explore outwards in all directions at once. But it can also uh, pull back, prune itself uh, and consolidate certain pathways to, to leave certain um, uh, well-trodden routes or highways. So um, just to flag that, that convergence is, is a, a larger theme uh, as well. But to answer your question, I think what, what you often see is that symbioses are formed at times of crisis, a uh, crisis in a Greek sense. Um, and um, because the nature of symbiosis is that both partners together are able to do something that they couldn't do by themselves. But in order to do that thing that they can do together, that they couldn't do by themselves, there has to be some imperative for them to do so. Um, so I think um, times of flux, moments of transition, um, and it might not be that the environment has changed, it might just be that those two organisms are moving into a different kind of um, environment, like um, algae and fungi coming together at the earliest days of plant life on land. Um, so that's one of the ways that, that it's commonly thought about, and, and, and I find that very helpful, uh, especially at this moment as humans, to think about the new relationships we can forge, both with humans uh, and with more than humans, as we look towards the future of life on a damaged planet. Yeah, it's really interesting to me because, you know, I'm disabled, so I have to constantly be problematizing this idea of like the individual out of myself who can be self-sufficient and that there are absences in me that could I could, you know, within a normal paradigm problematize, but maybe there are invitations to these more risky collaborations and we can begin to look at, you know, 
our absences, our voids, our incompleteness as perhaps an invitation to these collaborations. And I thought that mapped really nicely onto your exploration of how fungi and plants first began to co-evolve over time. And you know, it was plants lack that invited in um, fungi's collaboration. Um, and it's interesting also in a kind of a mythical level also that, you know, I would think a lot about symbi endosymbiosis, the beginning of our very bacterial cells that, you know, they have digested each other. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily a pretty experience. So how can we problematize this kind of pristine, precious idea of symbiosis as being something that's much riskier and um, more creative? I think this is really important, uh, is often thought, I mean, so first of all, the, the word symbiosis is, uh, it encompasses all different ways of living together, you know, from on this big long uh, spectrum, not just a linear spectrum, but a big confusing um, multi-dimensional spectrum with broadly speaking, um, parasitism at one pole where some partners benefit at the expense of the others uh, and then mutualism on the other pole where, where all partners benefit from the association and everything in between uh, and relationships given relationships can flux around on that spectrum uh, according to all sorts of um, variables uh, and um and changing conditions so so yeah so the idea that symbiosis is some sweet utopian um lovely story is is certainly not true um, and, um, I think about it, I find the most helpful analogy to be human collaborations. I, I, I love jazz. I find jazz a very helpful metaphor for understanding so much about the universe and, and about life. Um, but I think about jazz bands and I'd say, think about say, um, a, a touring jazz trio in the fifties where, um, difficult characters or maybe one difficult character, um, and there's an enormous tension between the players, but every night they have to get up on the stand and they play devastatingly um, uh, inspired performances. Um, their interactions off stage are filled with tension. There's a huge amount of tension on stage in their performance, in the notes they create and discords that they lean into. Um, into and, and, and through that tension, all sorts of innovation can arise, all sorts of new possibilities um, exist suddenly. Um, and they collaborate enough for them to end up on the stand every night at the same time and put out their instruments at the same time and start and stop at the same time and indeed to play in time. But they might be fighting furiously off stage and might not even be talking to each other. Um, they might have fights, they might punch each other, um, break each other's instruments. So this is um, I, I, this is a very extreme case. Um, it's something that I um, you can see in family lives as well. Um, so I, I, or any number any number of relationships that that, that we make um so collaboration in this sense to me seems like a, a, an alloy of competition and cooperation and all sorts of other uh, dynamics within that um so for me that's a way to to see symbiosis as encompassing many things uh, uh, and to step beyond the kind of um perhaps the too easy um, utopian view yeah, it's really interesting for me to apply it to a kind of anthropological or mythological um, lens and think about how cultures will, you know, reflux into each other and begin to kind of mutually create something new. And it's usually an antagonistic experience. You know, the thing that I have the most experience with is the history of Mediterranean mythology. And then, of course, how Christian how Christianity becomes co-opted by empire. And yet there are very complicated creative processes that happen like you know when the cult of uh tutelary land deities in england gets co-opted syncretically into you know roman imperial versions of christianity um and so i do think it's a way of creating a more robust lens to look at these creative processes that are yeah they are the process of colonialism and yet they are making something new and sometimes hardier Sometimes the only way for a belief system for God to continue existing is to have that risky collaborative experience. Yeah, I guess, and sometimes you have deities that would um, that have never died out, but they've just transformed, um, yeah. have been renamed, um, sprouted into into different fruiting bodies, as, as perhaps you, you you might you might say. Um, <laughs> sprouted. That's great. Sprouted. <laughs> <laughs> But I like the way you talk about um, these deities as reproductive events, um, as emergences of deeper mythological tropes um, and archetypes that humans have lived with for an unknowably long time, which arise and are personified in different forms at different times and different places, depending on where um, they are. Um, and then they might pop up somewhere else, um, according to different 
you know, parameters and, and, and logics of, of that moment, uh, but echo these older and deeper themes. Um, and I was wondering, actually, when you use that metaphor um, of these reproductive events, say Dionysus as a reproductive event, as if it was the mushroom or the spores produced by the mushrooms, what do you, what would you then liken to the mycelial network? Do you think of that as a kind of collective unconscious? Do you think of that as some oh, kind of shared psycho-spiritual composite? I think it's a kind of a, a, lo, a locus genius, a, a loci genius. It's, it's the spirit of place. I, I, I honestly think that it's not archetypes. I'm kind of allergic to a Jungian anthropocentric idea of these like, you know, ideal forms that are uh, associated with human culture and mythologies. I mean, I really deeply believe that like myth is the land and that we personify these elementals um, and that we we give them, you know, human shapes in, sort of, in order to understand them better, in order to transmit that knowledge generation to generation generation it's easier to transmit a story than it is to transmit a list or you know the lists of plants it's but it's it's there it's more durable i oftentimes think that we've offloaded all of our information into books and lists and that's not very durable the most durable information is carried in boats of breath and compelling stories um, so I oftentimes think that that mycelial system is, is the spirit of place that's using coming up through the feet it's kind of like when you wrote about ophia cordyceps unilateralis I oftentimes think that myth at its best is, is grabbing you by the feet like Garcia Lorca Duende like and coming up through you and sprouting through your head. And, you know, if you're a good myth teller, you might die in the process, you know, we, and just to, again, to circle back to this idea of, of eco preciousness, let's complicate the idea that our individual human aliveness is part of the plan. Mm. Oh, I like that very much. Um, and it's something that you see when you're looking at, um, organisms like fungi and like plants too which aren't centralized like we are um, and you can grow a, a, a fungus uh, you can take a mycelial network and you can take fragments of that mycelial network and bring them up in totally different situations and conditions and circumstances and, and they'll look radically different from each other um, uh, frequently um, and they'll form um, different types of network they might fruit they might not fruit and they might choose different types of fruit or spores depending on the conditions um, and so in that moment you can see the conditions there the what we might call the environmental conditions is a very boring way to describe uh, some in some sense the spirit of a place um, yeah. but erupting through the morphology and the behavior of those organisms uh, and in some sense these less centralized organisms like fungi uh, and plants which pour themselves into their environment um, are maybe easier ways to read those um, those expressions of a place uh, than, than organisms like us which both of the more centralized, but also move around. Well, I was actually, I was thinking about how, you know, uh, if you pour mycelial fungi into an ecosystem, they become a map of relationships. And if you pour a myth in the old oral sense of a myth into a place, it becomes a map of relationships. Like I was thinking Homer didn't have a structured memorized story and Homer wasn't a single person. He was a Homeric tradition of bards that would have stock epithets and episodes that they would, as you have talked about, decompose, break apart and recompose to suit a specific climatological social situation. And, you know, of course this was high risk. They could be killed or not paid if they told the story in a way that didn't suit a specific map of people and relationships. And so, and they were called the rhapsodes, the stitcher of songs. And I, of course, you know, as a poet, I was like the stitcher of songs and mycelial fungi are the stitcher of these, of these relationships. So I was thinking of the, the rhapsode the bardic tradition in the Mediterranean is being one of decomposing stories, actually, that in order to keep the Odyssey alive, you have to constantly be breaking it down and then recomposing it. Um, I'm wondering if there were any myths or stories that you were reading or working with alongside while you were composing and decomposing this book. Hmm. Or like figures that were helpful in your thinking. Yeah, um, there were lots of figures who were helpful who were, I mean, there were figures like um, um, Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher, uh, whose work I find very um, helpful in providing a, a, a general structure, a, 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 a bold and brave and open-ended metaphysical schema in which so many diverse aspects of human life can, can exist, um, rather than some um, other more reductive metaphysical schemas, which um, in order to exist, have to first of all police their boundaries and exclude a great deal of everyday human experience, mm. um, which feels to me perverse and, and counterintuitive, uh, and in many cases violent. Um, so Whitehead was very, very powerful for me, and and one of the reasons why White was, Whitehead was powerful was because he he admits within his schema he admits 
all sorts of different human cosmologies and ways of knowing and observing and um, and recording and telling and uh, and myth and so he he brought with him a whole sort of a whole world of, of myth uh, and story um in a sense um, and so that, that he's one person that i found um i found very helpful i suppose alongside that these well-worn stories of a um a journey and a return a kata basis a, a journey under underneath so journey down um into underland or um and we see this story reflected in so many different parts of the world in, in so many different myths from alice in wonderland to inanna to um whatever uh, and, and it's very much a, a sort of fungal journey um because so much of fungal life is underground or at least under the surface of whatever they happen to be living in and so these descent and return stories were were ones I, where i found very helpful and in some cases in writing i um i had to try and see the role of narrator in the book as the role of a sort of guide in that kind of a journey mm, yeah that's really interesting i was thinking a lot about looking at underworld myths as always having you have to risk your own individual heroic narrative you have to collaborate and and work with other beings in the underworld in order to come back up that inanna you know collaborates with the fly and also the little dirt beings i forget what their names are they're very funny um and that whenever you go down to the underworld you have to you have to reach your hands out you have to tie your roots together um so that's very fungal in, in its um uh in its narrative form. But I also, I wonder sometimes that we will, you know, oscillate from prizing one um, form um, to another and rearticulate the same problem. So we're really fetishizing underworld journeys right now. And just because we were, we were fetishizing ascent journeys for so long, how can we tie them back together? How can we think more cyclically, cyclically rather than just moving in one direction? Because that seems to me I was interested, I, one of my favorite parts of the book was this idea of fungal interruption and fungal absence and how it's this moment where rot doesn't happen, where the cycle is interrupted that creates undigested matter, that creates the very fuel of climate change today. Uh, I mean, for me, the best metaphor of that is Jesus, that Jesus interrupts this long history of vegetable gods that die, mulch back into the ground and then resurrect, but they're constantly going back into the ground from which they originally sprouted and that Jesus doesn't, he ascends, his, there is no body, there's an interruption in process. So how do we, how can we tie underworld fungal journeys back into these, into the, into the coming back into activity, into relationship, into culpability within a very complicated culture? Well, I think if you just follow the, I mean, if you just follow the life of the organism that we're talking yeah. about, or a, I, I'd say let's choose one type of fungus uh, of the many, there are many ways to be a fungus, um, of course. And, um, but if you were just to follow the life of one fungal organism, um, part of it might be a, a descent in the sense of a growing into, a burrowing into in a mycelial form into their food, into their substrate. Um, some kind of digestion process but usually there's production of a propagule of a spore or, or, or spores which are then um very frequently um they they journey on an ascent process um that ascent might be airborne um uh, through ex you know, expanding from mushroom gills uh, but it might be an ascent which requires an intermediary like truffles um they they first their ascent is heralded by um ribboning outwards of, of of sexy volatile compounds that, that distract an animal which acts as a kind of angel for the truffles and um, and then the spores can enter the above ground world and, and begin their process so in the, in the case of these entomopathogenic fungi the cordyceps or fear cordyceps fungi then um the ant is a kind of um uh, an angel i suppose we might say a, 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 a dark <laughs> twist on, on on angel in a sense of messenger um uh, even, and so so anyway, so I think if we just follow if we pay attention to the life forms um then it becomes clear that you can't just go down you have to come up to and that's what you see in these descent stories there's always a return at least usually there's a return usually a return yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really interesting also to think about uh the extended phenotype that you wrote about in your book and, and you know how the mushroom coming out of the ant's head is still an expression of the genetic composition of the fungi working through it and the thing i'm very interested in is fermentation and, and and alcohol that it seems to me and i wonder i as someone who probably is much better researched in this what you think about the beer before bread hypothesis and can we look at civilization and kind of use sociality and the, and the way that humans even organize today as being a very complicated fungal story rather than being a human story 
Yeah, I think it's a complicated animal story, a complicated fungal story, and a complicated plant story, a complicated bacterial story, and and an even more complicated story um, at the nexus where all of those complicated stories meet in elaborate multitrophic symbiotic um, concrescences. Um, and um, so for sure. And um, with regard to the bit before bread hypothesis, I, it feels like one of those lovely scholarly ping pong matches, you know, bread before beer, beer before bread, bread before beer. I, I like that we're living in an era where the beer before bread hypothesis has been gaining traction. Um, that seems intuitively more plausible to me. Um, and um, not least because um, when we think of beer today, I'm drinking some now, um, we think of um, just an alcoholic beverage with some hops in it. Um, but for much of human history, it's been more than that. Beer has been a um, a way to um, extract, to transmit, to store uh, medicinal plants, uh, fungi, whatever um, might be around, um, either for curative purposes or for psychoactive um, ritual purposes or both. Uh, and so it seems um, much more easy for humans to aggregate themselves around, form a kind of cult around, uh, become fascinated by, um, disruptively fascinated by um, a brewing process than a baking process. Um, it might be my bias that thinks that. Um, no, yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's very interesting that you see these, these, and they also, they biologically ennoble a certain material. They also provide calories. I was reading that beer and talking with David Zilver, the fer ferment, the fermenter about how, you know, they calorically powered the building of, you know, Gobekli Tepe, no, is it Gobekli Tepe? No, mm -hmm. yeah, Gobekli Tepe, the pyramids, and that you would give your allotment of beer to these people at the, who were building it, not just for the kind of intoxication of, uh, effect, but for the very minerals that, you know, we can only build culture very practically materially through the calories provided by these early intoxicants, which is interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And yet you also, I'm just thinking on my feet, you know, you have people who are living in these really bad conditions who are used to usually roaming about and having food and not having to constantly live in these squalid, you know, bacterial, like illness infested situations who are drinking enough to be able to tolerate it too. So it's an interesting feedback loop that we're able to tolerate civilization. We create civilization to drink and then we're able to tolerate civilization because we're drinking. Certainly. and and although. I do think that humans would have been drinking for a lot longer um, because fruits ferment by themselves yeah. and honey ferments by itself. And um, and so the alcohol story, I think, has much deeper roots um, mm. than that. And um, and it's fun to think about how deep it goes. I talk in the books a little bit about this mutation that we have, ADH4, alcohol dehydrogenase 4, which um, it's, arose about 10 million years ago, um, which allows us to break down alcohol as a source of energy um, to not become um, totally poisoned by it. And um, that mutation is very stable in our genomes. We share it with um, a number of other primates. And it suggests that a very long time ago, uh, it was useful for us to be able to consume alcohol. And, so it's a hangover um, that now, it, it, are we no longer adapted to it? I mean, that's my question right now, because spirits, as far as I understand, like concentrated alcohol, like we drink now, is actually relatively recent in the span of evolutionary time. So is alcohol still adaptive? Well, that's a big question. Um, I think it depends who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there'd be people who'd say that it's caused... Um, that they, that, I mean, if you look at the periods of history, for example, where different narratives reigned. Um, so if you look at the temperance movement, um, yeah. and um, this is reacting to a period of extreme alcoholism, of alcoholism using to um, enforce indentured labor, um, destroying families, um, creating cycles of addiction in order to exploit. Um, and so in that kind of story, then uh, you'd think that it actually that the alcohol is, is not at all adaptive, at least to the people who are being exploited. It might be adaptive for those doing the exploiting. Um, um, and But then that, that narrative might shift and change. I, I personally find alcohol a very generative thing in my life and in the life of my friends. Um, I've seen it cause problems, of course, um, and the hangovers are not fun either um, when they occur. So I think this is very ambiguous and it shuttles in and out of like most of the classics are saying, like the difference between medicine and poison is dosage. Um, and, um, and we're a culture so, that doesn't 
know how to dose anything. I mean, I think poisons don't even exist in a lot of cultures. It's more pharmacon. It's like, it's contextual. Mm. It's like, mm. you, you understand how much you can take. And in this culture, we will take as much as we can of everything. So of course you have to have the concept of poison because we don't mm. know how to dose anything. Um, I mean, I also think it's interesting. So I, I oftentimes talk about myths that are deracinated, that are uprooted from context, and then they can, you know, ossify into dogma and being misused by colonialism. And I think of alcohol as being deracinated from public social events and from ritual and spirituality. Like I think of the temperance movement as occurring at a time where alcohol is occurring in the home and it's occurring outside of, of ritual, outside of spirituality and outside of, you know, other people checking you. Um, which is an interesting thing to think about. It is no longer existing within its root system. Mm. Yeah, although, I mean, for much of, I mean, look at medieval Europe, then people would have been drinking more or less all the time you know, at yeah. home, at work, um, sure. wherever. Um, so I don't think it's always so straightforward to draw those lines. Um, but no, I think it's a very powerful force. And I, and I think it's also very important to, as you, as you um, allude to in this question, uh, to, to, to flip the frame. Um, and to see us as respondents uh, or, or, or um, not the leaders in the dance. Um, and um, most dances, you know, you can see as some kind of dynamic interplay of um, call and response and response and call and call and response. And um, I think it's like that in evolutionary terms as well. And I think there's definitely ways in which we have um, been um, domesticated <laughs> by the organisms that we like to think of as having domesticated. Yeah. Hmm. Hey Sophie, I think it'd be great for you to, to 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 comment a little bit in this context on this whole desire to re reframe how uh, the the rewilding of the masculinity and the softness and the kindness that that really can be revealed by us by the masculinity touching the divine feminine, you know, and it, it, it will be a nice a nice a nice for you to reflect a bit on that i think for the attendees you know sure yeah i mean just as there's no monolithic fungi there's no monolithic masculinity you know fungi is a kingdom like a, a giant biodiversity of many different patterns and behavior same is true as for masculinity but masculinity has been unfortunately conflated with one type of patriarchal um behavior and that's to the detriment not just of other people but of men themselves um i will always say that I didn't order this book off the menu <laughs> to go back to being hijacked. Um, it started as a joke project that then of course ballooned out into a whole other, into a book. Um, but it was not something that I planned on doing. Um, I just started climbing up the leaf stalk and then the mushroom came out. Um, I do think I always wanna problematize this idea of there being two, you know, just because we have two hands and we have bodies that are bilateral doesn't mean that everything comes in value dualisms, that, you know, gender is much more mycelial than anything, that, you know, there are beings that change gender when there are different environmental pressures. And so too, should we lunate through different expressions? And I think for me, the important thing with this book was saying, men have only been given one story for a long time. So it's no surprise that they're acting out a very sterile problematic story. So what if we look backwards and see if there were more, more representations of what masculinity could look like? And there were, um, you know, I grew up with a father who had been a Zen master and he, um, but he was interested in the history of religion. And he taught me when I was really little to think of things as koans. So riddles that you didn't try and solve, but accompanied you, that you like walked with and try, instead of trying to solve. And as I was looking at these stories of men who could be considered patriarchal heroes, I kind of didn't try and solve them. I just walked alongside them like a koan, like a rock I was holding. And was like, what are you gonna show me if I bring you on trips with me? And so I, I would say the first six months of quarantine, I was taking like King David, I was taking my favorite characters, Tristan from the Tristan and his old myth. And I was saying like, what am I missing here? What, what if you're much more complicated than I thought you were? So yeah, that's a little bit of my, that's my blurb. That's my spiel. I guess, uh, I guess the thing is, is, is the man over nature, man over woman, that, that, that has been become so embedded. That's what's led us to being, I think, uh, disabled from our reacquaintance yeah. with the power of fungi, right? You know, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's not just even man over nature, it's mind over. So here's something really interesting. So I think I'm a person who experiences PTSD and trauma, but I also sometimes think of cultural bodies as operating like bodies with trauma. And so I see the end of the Bronze Age, like the end of these nature reverent partnership cultures where you honestly never see heroic individuals in the art or the iconography. In fact, you rarely see humans. You see like polyphonic um, experiences of many different animals, chevrons, weather patterns, but that ends. And that shifts into a more Greek heroic culture where you have um, a split in Platonism, actually, in, in Socr the figure of Socrates between mind and matter that then gets rearticulated inside the theology of Christiani Christianity via Rome, so which becomes spirit and matter. But I think about that split that happens as actually being what happens in a cultural body that's traumatized. So at the end of the Bronze Age, you see drought, you see volcanic eruptions, you see massive genocide, five major civilizations um, fall apart within a thousand years, 500 years, I actually think. And so of course you see massive cultural trauma. So it doesn't surprise me that you see a disassociation like in, inside the very mythological narratives that these, these, that these cultures are trying to figure out their psychological trauma in. You see the, you know, when a body is traumatized, it often dissociates the mind from the body. And you see inside the very philosophy that is created by this time, the dis dis disassociation of mind and matter. Unfortunately, a trauma response over time becomes culture and becomes not adapted to changing circumstances. So I oftentimes don't think it, of it as man over woman. I think of it as a trauma response that is held on too long inside a um, spreading cultural body. It's so interesting to think about the ways that these um, traumas propagate and um, and the ways that they can be then rehoused within new narratives of convenience. I'm thinking of Galileo when he came up with his bifurcation of hmm. primary quant primary quantities and secondary yeah. qualities. So um, th at this point, it was, he, he was like, well, look, we want to explore the world experimentally. Yeah. Um, and to do that, we have to intervene in the world and to do that, we have to use number and we have to measure. So we'll have quantities, things that are measurable, which we can experiment and investigate with in this yeah. manner. But we'll bracket off in qualities, all the things we can't experiment with and explore in this manner. Uh, qualities. Um, there's obviously a hierarchy here because one's secondary and one's primary. Other qualities are flavor, sensation, mood, uh, feeling, the unquantifiables. Um, uh, and so this bifurcation uh, uh, into the to, into the measurable and, and to the unmeasurable, um, which is also then becomes matter and mind, um, object, subject, uh, fact, value, uh, any number of the vexed dualisms that still haunt us um, was originally, at least in Galileo's terms, a, 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 a way that we could um, make life easier for ourselves. Um, yeah. And so it's funny to yeah, it's funny to see them echoing backwards and forwards within. Um, I like this trauma response uh, reading, and, and I guess we do that in our own bodies as well. The things that we have, we we start to hang on to, and we start to to legitimize in all sorts of ways. Which is also interesting to think about how even in my own life, you know, fungi can interrupt those neural patternings, those patterns that have been stuck. So a survival mechanism at first is is necessary and and not a bad thing. That you know, I oftentimes think about you know the birth of this kind of material reductionist thinking is is deeply sensual. It's a it's a, pri a prizing of the world again and of of the senses. But then, of course, over time, it becomes this more sterile, ossified idea, this split. Um, and so, I was thinking about how in your own body you take psilocybin, and those neural pathways can oftentimes reconnect and break patterns. So how do we break patterns? How do we break patterns in science and mythology and in our own lives? Um, are there ways that you're, here's, here's a question I have for you. So yes, we can tell everyone to take psilocybin. Sure. Yeah. Are there ways we can think with fungi, not just taking them, that can shift the ways we've become stuck culturally? Personally, I think yes. Um, one of the reasons why I have been moved to study funky, one of the reasons I have been moved to write Entangled Life um, and to continue my studies and work with funky is for precisely this reason. Um, the more I think about these organisms in their lives, um, the more I'm tricked out of my preconceptions. Um, and the more I land in, in a state where the familiar becomes 
unfamiliar again. And I think so much of um, our growth and evolution, both as individuals and, and as uh, species and as different cultures, is to do with this process of defamiliarizing um, in the Elliot line, to arrive where you started and see it as if for the first time. Um, for me, good art is something that does that. Um, a piece of music that I find compelling will leave me feeling altered and I'll see some everyday object in some new way. I maybe even just notice it, um, whereas I wouldn't notice it before. So to startle me into presence, startle me into listening to what's going on around, uh, into, uh, into just a state of um, observational curiosity um, and, um, and gratitude frequently. And so, um, so Fungi do this for me in all sorts of ways, just learning about their lives, um, but thinking about their lives, talking to people who have spent longer than me thinking about certain aspects of their lives. Um, cultivating them, um, doing experiments with them, um, whatever it might be. I think direct contact with these organisms is a really good way to go. Just growing, I'm getting a mushroom grow kit and growing it in your kitchen. You know, that's a really easy thing to do. Um, and it's a very small act uh, in the big picture of um, human fungal relations. But I think it, just to watch these creatures grow in your home, supposedly, um, is a whole it, it's it's a it's, it's a something that can if you can let it affect you then it, it, it can be very powerful um so yes yeah, so i find um there are, i mean i could go on about this for a very long time but the short answer is yes absolutely and, and it's one of the things that keeps me coming back to um, to fungal life hmm. yeah do you have any practices in your day-to-day -day life like a daily practice that helps you do that that helps you create that um, process it depends um it depends on what's going on at any given time it might go it might be something to do with um i might go for a walk and i might see i might decide that i'm going to imagine all of the plant life that i can see bursting up from the ground as the visible expressions of fungal relationships and so that work that walk would defamiliarize plants to me they'll become these visible outgrowths of a of, of fungal life um which would then steer my awareness towards what's going on below the ground. Um, I might, I don't do that all the time, but that's just one, an, sort of a game or an exercise that might be medicinal at, at a given moment. Um, or just eating mushrooms every day, just insisting that one meal a day at least must be of mushrooms. Um, or um, drinking this beer now, it's a Belgian beer, a wild lambic beer made with communities of yeast, which are not added, but they're let in um, the wild communities of yeast that are invited into um, the wort, um, and you have completely different spectrums of flavor. Um, <clears throat> you can really taste that it's been made by a community uh, of a successional um, sequence of yeasts picking up from where the previous ones left off. Um, so I might drink this beer and I might decide to lean into the the polyphonic nature of, of the, the flavor and, and to think about the creatures that might have made it, this kind of thing. Um, so I don't really have just one fixed um, practice, but but practices of fungal lens, um, uh, yeah, very helpful. Yeah, what about you? I have so many practices. They're mostly just being as goofy as possible. I mean, I think like goofiness is actually my um, portal into the divine and into interrupting my experience with animals that I'm not just seeing my homogenized idea of how they're supposed to act. So if I see a crow, I try and talk crow badly. Like I I, I try and be as ridiculous in my neighborhood as possible with the other beings so that it interrupts my experience and other people's. Um, and I did have a pretty amazing experience yesterday where I walked down to the river where I go every day. So also going to a sit spot with no expectation is just a very simple way of just seeing what arrives. Um, and at one of my sit spots, there was this huge, there's been this huge um, circle of false parasol mushrooms that have fruited up multiple times for the past three years, They're like as big as dinner plates. And so I've also begun thinking of that as like my guardian angel, <laughs> the tutelary land deity that I sometimes see the expression of, but mostly don't um, nearby. But I also think that as you invite in other beings, they will, they'll show up in more interesting ways. I mean, this can be true of fungi, this can be true of birds and animals and many different species. Like these, these gulls, seagulls that are usually very frenetic, never stop moving, all lined up along the, um, the boardwalk and were just staring at me and they weren't moving. And it was a very, and I, I knew them well enough that I knew it was a very unusual behavior. So I love the idea of, of knowing a being, knowing a fungi, knowing a patch of land, having enough intimacy that I can tell when it's being out of character, when it's acting in a different way. Yeah. Mm. 
Is, okay. is the goofiness, uh, you think that's a, a therapeutic practice we should adopt? I think we have to be as goofy as possible. We have to not take ourselves seriously. And I think it's like a physical thing, like imitate other beings. You know, I always like do this when I see the mountain from a different perspective, like just make your clown. I think clowning is, okay. is the right way forward. I think this is very important. Um, and another way that we can trick ourselves out of our preconceptions, right? Yeah. The trickster is the tricker. Um, and uh, and the sacred clown and um yeah and i find um, in many ways funky are, are, are very much like that there's a kind of trickster energy to it uh, to and i mean there's so many ways to be a fungus as well so i, I do feel uncomfortable talking about the entire um monolithic. stunning yeah. there's a staggering diversity of this realm of life it, it, like that but yeah. um but certainly from a human perspective um there are lots of ways that i feel that um that we are made <laughs> mockery of in a healthy way uh, by <laughs> yeah. fungal life and i think well, you can see this when people struggle to understand fungi but right? we'll try to fit them shoehorn them into categories that so blatantly don't fit um fungal taxonomy is uh, an, an amazing and very important field um, but it's very difficult for taxonomists to get a handle on fungi they slip around in the systems of classification that we build for them and um i i i I think fungal taxonomy is one of the most uh, noble pursuits that anyone could do. I'm not a fungal taxonomist myself. I've never been a taxonomist really of any sort. Um, I'm very glad that taxonomists exist uh, and I respect them deeply. Um, and I also feel like there is some little bit of humor being um, conjured by these organisms refusing to fit into our boxes. Um, and so I enjoy the kind of the noble wrestling um, with potentially an insoluble problem, a kind of koan. Hmm. Is there okay? Am I uh, to... uh, no, I, I want to. Um, <laughs> I want to just feed a couple of a couple of questions in, you know, because. Um, so, let's see. Any advice for scientists and poets to, for increasing our ability to listen to the diversity of the fungal stories that you guys are, you know, exchanging thoughts about into our culture, you know. What, what is the advice we might give to others who are anxious to uh, imbue, be, be, get more involved in this storytelling or this, this understanding of these myths and the roots of these myths, you know? You guys have Me? Okay. Um... <laughs> I use your organism, use your body. Your body is, is filled with portals. You know, eat, smell, touch, taste, lie on the ground, pretend like you're, you know, it, don't fungi have like their whole skin is appetitive, is tasting. So lie on the ground and eat sunlight and eat dirt, like uh, imitate fungi also um, with your whole body. And, use and, and don't just use your brain. Of course, you can listen to podcasts. You can read Merlin's wonderful book. There are so many ways in, but you can also go in with your whole body. Um, so I think a great way is, is to imbibe. I mean, if you're drinking alcohol or you can do kombucha or, you know, you can take yeast and, I mean, not yeast, honey and water, close a little jar and make mead. And then all of a sudden you're communing with, with a deity, with Dionysus. The Dionysus is just a rainwater inoculated beehive. Um, so yeah, you can pray to the fungal deities in, in all sorts of very practical, small ways. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I think fermentation is a really good way um, to be led by, especially wild fermentation, fermentation which you've not um, started by adding a, a preconceived culture of microbes. Um, and to be led by the mystery of it, to try and to find yourself with this fermentation process as if you've never been there before, as if you didn't know what this was. Um, and to yeah to arrive there and see it as if for the first time I, I find this endlessly powerful um not least because you can taste these extraordinary processes these chemical metabolic processes with your own unaided senses um your own sensorial um apparatus is the lab uh, and and some of these ferments will even change that sensorial apparatus into some even more um unusual way into some unusual form so I agree. Fermentation is a very grounding practice for me, um, and to see myself as a um, as a a vector um, somehow in, in a larger process. I think uh, Merlin. Don't, it it seems to me that you know, like some of the work that you, even your brother Cosmos does in the in the in the idea of 
storytelling and singing and music and going into the forest. And it, 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 it kind of inspires me to comment on that because, you know, I think this playfulness and, and, and this goofiness is, is something that's really a great takeaway today, you know, in, in a mm. time where we're so combating stress, you know? Mm. Yeah, I, I really do feel like humor is woven into the warp and weft of the universe. Um, and when funny things happen, I mean, funny things happen to me and my brother all the time. Um, we've just both bought old chapels in, in you know, quite close to each other, old, old Methodist chapels. Um, and it feels like with a punchline in a um, in a larger joke, um, we could see that this is a joke going on. It's, it's so it's so so weird and so funny, and it was really not intentional. Um, and uh, it's so I like I like being seeing like m my life and my actions as um, as those that are available to humor making by larger forces um, that I might not fully understand. I, I think as someone who has been through extraordinarily intense experiences in my life, I think, you know, as Blake says, excess of grief laughs. That, you know, when you don't understand what your God is asking of you, you laugh. The absurdity is when you've exited the, 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 narrow, the narrow strictures of, of human right and wrong. You know, laughter is outside of that, it's to the side. It's, you know, it's when you step into an, a, a totally different perspective. So I think humor is the way to deal with climate catastrophe, actually. You know, that if we become too dogmatic and, and, and theological and, 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 and kind of rearticulate these Christian ideas of being the savior and of atoning, um, we'll never actually create more interesting connections. That it's an, you know, I think of if, if an improvisation. When you're doing improvisation with other people, you're told not to make the right or wrong decision. You're supposed to make the most interesting decision. So I've been thinking about that a lot, which is like, how do you not create a moral interpretation of what's happening, but just try and laugh as much as possible and create the most tricky, maybe messy decision? I have a question there asking, uh, you know, on books or, or authors or <laughs> poets that maybe are recently or kind of inspiring um since they many of the attendees i think have read your books you know or are intending to so there is that question if there's anything that really pops to your mind i want to just try to share that i have one it's so good it's called when we cease to understand the world by benjamin labitude and it's kind of a blend of science historical writing fiction it's a it's like a genre it's a symbiotic genre it's hard to explain and it's short it's very very good um, so I, I really recommend that one. Thank you. Um, I recommend um, a, a very long book by um, Ian McGilchrist <laughs> called <laughs> The Matter With Things, which is, um, I have not read it in its entirety, but I find um, the parts that I do read enormously helpful uh, in bringing together a huge range of um, thinking, um, often heterodox thinking, uh, and making a space for it all to converge uh, and um, just enormously helpful. Um, another one, um, I've just finished reading a book by um, called Super Infinite about John Donne, the poet by mm. Catherine Rundell. Um, and she writes brilliantly about, uh, about John Donne and about the power of poetry and about the power of um, language um, to transform the way that we think and feel and understand. Um, so that's a good one. I would recommend and, and another book, a book of poetry called Wet Dream by Erin Robinson, um, which is um, which is so, so deep um, and will put you in all sorts of wonderful directions. That's awesome. I think a, I think a, a, a question that keeps coming up is, you know, uh, you know, guys, when is there a is there one outstanding takeaway or principle or inspiration from the investigation into the mycelium that just overwhelmingly resonates, you know, uh, uh, several people are asking that. So I'm sharing that question, you know. <laughs> um, there's never one with mycelium. I don't think there's never <laughs> one with the, with the living world in general, but um, there are a few. Um, and um there's a very many, great many few. Um, 
what comes to mind right now, um, the importance of context, um, not just when we're thinking about my scene, but thinking about anything, um, where uh, and with whom, more importantly, is this process occurring. Um, another one, the processual nature of reality, everything is a process in time, <clears throat> things are just stabilized processes. Um, this I find uh, a very helpful way to, um, to be reminded by fungal life, by mycelial life, uh, of a bigger truth. Um, and another one might be um, ambiguity, to lean into ambiguity without trying to force a resolution one way or another. Um, another one might be the power of open questions to remember to find excitement in what we don't know, um, to endure um, or, or to delight in um, the unanswered questions that put us forward into being. Um, the power and importance of the lives we don't see, uh, of those lives that lie hidden from us um, as well. It's another one. But I could go on. Sophie, what do you say? I would say that it's, for me, the, the thing that they teach me, so I have a connective tissue disease and they are connective tissue. And I love that resonance um, and what it teaches me about how my healing doesn't necessarily take place in my own body, but in my relationships. And I think that's the thing that I take away from them, which is that life, intelligence, mind is not in a atomized self, it's interstitial. It occurs at the interface, the ecotone. I think of ecotones, a place where there's the highest biodiversity of fish and birds. It's where one ecosystem radically changes into another. It's that thick boundary. And it's the thick boundaries between us where eco, oikos for home, tone for tonos, tension, the place where we hold tensions together. And I think that fungi for me are really good at holding tensions without trying to resolve them, at accompanying the koan, at thinking, realizing that my mind isn't in here, it's in my relationships. If I'm with different people, I'll have a different mind. If I'm with different, breathing in different microbiome and pheromones, I will be part of a different psyche. That psyche isn't in here, it's shared. Um, and so for me, fungi help me to realize that myself is not in here, it's somewhere where my roots fuse into other roots, both metaphorically and very practically in terms of what I'm eating and imbibing and the people who I'm sharing space with and the beings I'm sharing space with. So to constantly be problematizing the idea of like an individual author, an individual person, a person who can have you know branded ideas, even that, like they, they're always helping me to relax this idea of anything belonging to me. I don't I don't, you know, I belong to a, a psyche, to a hollow bind assemblage, a constellation of species of which I am only one small little star. That's awesome. <laughs> I want to just take a minute because, you know, there's, we're fortunate and blessed, you know, at the Alchemist Kitchen to have such a, a you know, great and growing community. And I always like to take a minute and, Sophie and, and Merlin mentioned earlier, he can mention again, are there any organizations or people doing great work at the nonprofit level, at the social level that um, we could encourage our attendees to, to, to get in contact with, to follow, maybe make donation in the spirit of, uh, of this conversation today? Someone's just put spun on the chat and that's what I was going to say. Um, the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks, um, who I work with, um, doing uh, what I think is really important work, um, trying to bring the underground lives, the lives of mycorrhizal fungi and all of the relationships that they enable um, and participate in, um, to bring these lives underground into the purview of human decision-making realms, um, policy-making um, and designing conservation initiatives, restoration projects. Um, and to be able to, um, to do that, we need to know who roughly, uh, who's living where uh, and, and what these communities look like. So one of the work that's, one of the pieces of work that Spun's doing is to try and create uh, maps of the global mycorrhizal fungal communities, which can then um, provide some kind of basis for us to um, start to take them into account when we're making our decisions. And um, there are many other aspects of SPUN besides, um, but um, but this is one of them. And, and it's um, something I find very, very powerful and, and timely. Thank you for that. Sophie, any, any uh, organization you just wanna give a prop to? Your own home. Um, I actually think that's the most important one, the five mile radius where you are. 
Um, I would also highlight Spun. So yes, Spun, absolutely. I love the work Spun is doing. It's really exciting. You know, if someone who loves the underworld mythically, the real underworld is also very important. We can't conserve the forest if we're not conserving its connections below ground. Um, but I also think that, you know, the beings that constitute your actual psyche, your brain, if your brain is a five mile radius, if it's bigger than you, you know, maybe your actual brain, we're very fixated on advocating for charismatic species for um, experiences that are happening a country away, but there is there is a cause where you are. I don't know what it is. I can't tell you. I don't have a simple heuristics, but find it. Five mile radius. Find the being that needs to use you as a mouthpiece. Well, that's awesome. That's so I, I so agree with it. And even becoming more hyper local, right? And really loving and being supportive and, and kind and generous to, to the world immediately that is around us, right? It's so good. Yeah. Thank you. Sophie, you have any last comments? Any any um, last thoughts you want to share with Merlin and the group? Well, there's so many more. Um, uh, I've been very inspired by your book. Thank you so much for letting that spore go into the winds. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's wonderful well, to chat. Yeah, it's really been great. And, and uh, hopefully this is an inspiration to everyone that this is a great time for us to become reacquainted with the power of the mushroom power of plants. Um, after all, they were here a long time before us and the way, way we're going, they may be here <laughs> way after us. So let's try to uh, love each other and be gracious and bring the mushroom more into our lives, you know. Thanks so much for your uh, attendance today. And this, this event will be recorded. It'll be sent to the attendees who could not uh, participate today live. All right, guys, thank you so much. All right, have a great rest of your day.